Good to have you back for what happens to be our 230th episode of ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. We are broadcasting live from, would you wish so, uh, one location at least, which is near Munich, Germany. Uh, my co-host, uh, DeSoto Brown, Bishop Museum historian and archivist, and uh, Ronald Lindgren, our leisure legacy leg legend, are number one under the weathers, uh, get better at DeSoto soon, and uh, run under the radar for family uh, visiting reasons, rightly so. So I'm going to deliver on behalf of the three of us, because we produced and prepared the show together which is uh, still uh, airing under the conditions of the three C's, which is uh, COVID, coronavirus, climate change, and civility uh, in brackets caused through increasing um, uh, unrest through social equity. So architecture has to do with uh, all three. And we're putting the hat on of uh, uh, reviewing and assessing and uh, critiquing constructively, critically, uh, the uh, most recent uh, developments on our island of Oahu, city of Honolulu. And if we can get the first slide up for that, uh, we're in the second volume of our uh, living wall, uh, Lilia in Waikiki building. And in the last show, we were looking at the framework of it at, at the setting, at the context. And uh, we were quoting Ron, who said recently, uh, unlike in his days, uh, unfortunately, the architect isn't quite so much in charge anymore of the architectural projects, unless they're star architects. Um, but these days, uh, other than that, they seem to be more facilitators rather than originators and producers of the buildings. So we've been uh, introducing the architects of the Lilia Waikiki project that um, I remembered from back in my student days when we were doing our field trips to the nearby. It only took us eight hours in my Plymouth Fury uh, to get to Chicago, which is the closest city nearby in the Midwest. And we were talking about a crate and barrel store that is now a Starbucks reserve on Michigan Avenue. Uh, that is by Solomon Cortwells and Buens. And just, I happened to talk, show quote, top left uh, to my uh, best uh, US buddy since my Prairie College days at our University of Lincoln, Nebraska, Dan Kubrick, who's associate with Jan, uh, uh, Helmut Jan behind, who tragically uh, died at young age of 81 in a, a bicycle accident uh, about half a year ago. And uh, dear Dan is hanging in there, and we've been uh, on the phone uh, the first time, shockingly, shame on us, uh, since a decade. Um, and so we were catching up, uh, and he told me that he, talking, speaking Michigan Avenue, he's working on a project, a tower condominium project on Michigan Avenue that is called, or the address is 1000 South Michigan Avenue, and the project is accordingly called 1000 M. It's a high-rise condominium. Uh, it's a glass tower, which uh, probably double or triple glaze, which makes sense in Chicago because he told me there's snow in. And the lake effect snow is especially quite something in the Midwest out there. So you got to protect yourself from that harsh climate that you do with that curtain wall. So that gets us back to Honolulu because uh, the fellow architect Solomon Cortwell Bunes, who are also in and from Chicago, uh, have already been on the island here with the projects you see on the three other show quotes or the, the two other ones on the right. But their first project was the one at the bottom left, which is uh, the second Howard Hughes Tower which we always nicknamed the intestines and actually the name they gave it, uh, which is uh, something like Anaha, uh, indeed even sounds a little bit like where the intestines ends. And it's a tower that we said after careful, considerate observation is fossil formalism. And they went through a lot of effort making it look funky and fancy through having the, the glass wave around but it is what I call a microwave and Ron calls it a refrigerator because it only works as such when you air condition it and when you turn the AC off, then that happens what I call it, then you get fried in there. 
And uh, it, uh, what DeSoto also uh, always, uh, you know, criticizes, rightly so, is that it has no lanai's, which we said by building code should be mandated that every building in Hawaii has of uh, what we, you know, enjoy the most to be outdoors, which we can do on lanai's, why Kurt Sanborn calls it idealistically and ideally stacked lanai's. And you wouldn't you wish so then maybe you know since the architects haven't done that they might be not considered anymore on the island but that is not the case because on the right side you see their recently proposed development that's the one where the uh richard meyer project got pulled and now solicon uh, Sol uh, um, uh, solomon court will buens kick in again with a tower that we were shocked uh because again nolan eyes again and just a refrigerator or microwave glass box. What makes it all even and a little worse from the Soto side is they named it uh, after Victoria Ward and they called it the Ward Place. And referring to the show with Richard Lowe from back in the days who had worked with Steve Owl on towers that tribute to the legacy of uh, uh, Victoria Ward, uh, this tower uh, does not so much. So that being said, uh, now Solomon Cortwell Buens are back. All good things are three, hopefully. That gets us to the following slide, please. And which is also my daily background that I choose. And this is uh, referring to the show quotes at the very top, a show that we called uh, Proletarian People Power Parking Plinths, five Ps, tongue breaker. And this is uh, the, um, the vision of if we all basically move away from private car transportation to more shared public transportation of multimodal kind, uh, we would, as an effect on the side, solve the big housing crisis, which addresses the third C, uh, civility and its threat because all of a sudden our urban nomads and everyone who would want to join them could uh, basically move in where uh, previously the cars had been parked and, uh, and shelter it as we can see here because they dedicate quite some uh, money and effort to these perforated metal screens here that you know, keep uh, the cars cool behind and they would keep uh, the, the people cool behind. Uh, next slide. This tower does it a little bit different because usually the default is that the parking plinth is on the street level. Here it is elevated, uh, pulled above it. And on the ground floor, you see something that developers really pride themselves for, although it's not something new. It's been around since the good old European people, uh, us, uh, you know, settled in America and, and came with a wagon train to stop and build a little towns and uh, the person running the saloon uh, downstairs lived upstairs and we we call this mixed use you don't do just one thing in your building you do multiple things in this case two things so here it is retail gets us to the next slide um, this has all been documented by us by the end of the last year. You see me here on my post-fossil vehicle, my bicycle, my, my burger bell uh, stopping by. You can see the building uh, primarily uh, under construction, uh, close to completion. You can already see something that uh, that is the sun, the sun we know so well, and the sun um, is kept out by this elevated uh, white part of the facade because it's opaque and closed. But uh, the glass behind that has just been recently installed um, only gets shaded by that little overhang upstairs and the rest of the glass uh, gets um, heated up. So we might have another uh, microwave problem that we can only solve on the expense of petroleum by refrigerating it. Next slide is the construction uh, sign that you see that gives us a clue about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the developer is, as you can read, Brookfield Properties. They're a mainland uh, um, um, a real estate developer company. And you see the general contractor as well, the name again of the project, and you see a rendering. And that rendering is depicting it in sort of a, a dusk uh, situation where the renderer did a good job uh, in making it look uh, tropical, exotic. You see palm trees, 
you see you see lights in there, but again, it's all fully glazed. So uh, from inside out, it might not be as uh, tropical exotic as the renderer tries to make it look like. Next slide. Uh, talking renderings. This is a rendering um, that shows the proposed project that is now pretty much completed. And we uh, uh, reviewed it when it was under completion, close to the end of completion here. And uh, there is a text quoting from the developer's website. And uh, we then also get a clue about the name uh, of the project. And as we can read here, it's a tribute to the favorite flower of Queen Emma. And that favorite flower was the lily, the lilia in uh, Hawaiian. So that you know, sets up the bar. Obviously, you know, um, the royals took good care uh, of their people and no one was left behind. And to that regards, we have to, uh, in our sort of assessment of the project, we give, have to give it a, a green check mark of the box of evaluating it because um, it prides itself to be the first um, you know, mixed use high rise development in 20 years in Waikiki. And since Waikiki is our monofunctional vacation neighborhood, this uh, makes a difference because it's basically for people to live there because it's a condominium. Um, it's uh, sorry, it's not a condominium because this is not for sale as the other ones by Howard Hughes that were looked at before, but it's for rent. It's a rental. It's a rental apartment tower. So that is primarily uh, a good thing. Uh, next slide. So, um, so we had a check on typology. Now we'll do our check on orientation. Here you see the Google view of it. Uh, the two uh, yellow pins, the one at the bottom uh, on uh, Kalakaua Avenue at the corner of Kapahu and Kalakaua is our Waikiki Grand that we know very well. And we can see because north is up, the north era is, is, is set in, in such way. You see that uh, uh, um, Kapahu um, Avenue runs pretty much east-west. So the buildings on it uh, face, if they're parallel to the street, pretty much directly south, which my Waikiki Grand does. The second pin up there at the top left is where the Lilia is. And you can see that the Waikikian grid is slightly offset from that pretty ideal east-west orientation with southern exposure because the Dillingham people didn't care too much about the bioclimatics, but more about the buck. And they basically, you know, basically set up the, the layout uh, of the lots in a way that was best uh, developed. So we're, we're having a slight turn towards west and west is problematic because that's where our intense sun sets and is so low that no cap, no lid is gonna help us uh, to that regard as uh, next slide. As it is uh, on our Waikiki Grand here, uh, my um, uh, generously, philanthropistly donated dedicated unit by my landlord for reasonable rent. Um, this is my lanai. And since I live what I teach and, um, and teach what I live um, is that I um, you know, celebrate the easy breezy lifestyle, I have my jealousies and my sliding door open all the time. And my lanai is fully shaded uh, in the summertime. And then each day, towards uh, you know, the, the spring and the winter, uh, the sun is eating approximately about an inch or close to of my level footprint because I'm not using air conditioning to cheat and allow me to be behind glass all year round. I'm basically um, accepting that the sun uh, is uh, chasing me. And in the winter, when the sun is the lowest, I have the smallest livable footprint if I don't want to get overheated. And then my footprint grows uh, towards the summer. And that's just the natural way to do it uh, without, again, cheating with uh, fossil fuel. So how is that playing out with the Lilia? Next slide. This is um, a view from uh, the northwest. And we also have to give the Lilia something, uh, another green uh, check mark. 
because orientation, again, is primarily good because it's running east-west, and that way it's not blocking the macro wind flow from Malka to Mackay. Uh, it's within, uh, oriented within the wind flow, and that's certainly um, a, a good thing to commend the building because there is other buildings like the Ritz-Carlton, for example, that is doing the opposite. It's sitting with its long side and it's basically blocking the winds and that way it also exposes its, its long facades towards the critical orientations of east and west, where again, the shading of a uh, candle levering horizontal lanai's as in my Waikiki Grand principally doesn't work. So we uh, go to the next slide where we see uh, again, uh, the building being in the, di or in the right direction. But we're also seeing uh, its end, its short end facing Malka, facing the mountains. And that one um, is then causing a situation that you can see um, rendered up there at the, at the top right, which might be good for the view, but it's not good for your thermal comfort because again, that's where the sun is low in the morning, shoots deeply in your space and um, makes the, a unit rather uh, costly, uh, not affordable, because um, first of all, the units are probably priced higher because of the view. And then your maintenance cost is really tall because you're having a pretty high electricity bill. Uh, that is the highest kilowatt hour price to begin with uh, in, in the Hawaiian Islands uh, in all America. And in Europe, we have the same thing. We have inflation rate going up to more than 5%, and that's mainly because of rising energy cost. And people here have to pay for it because otherwise you die from frostbites, which that doesn't happen in Hawaii. So you wouldn't have to do it uh, this hermetic uh, way uh, in Hawaii, uh, in Chicago, as we talk where Dan is, and in Munich, where I um, uh, likely would like to be now is uh, where this uh, won't happen. So uh, getting us to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, the view from the privileged units on the other end, on the, uh, on the west end. Uh, again, it's all about the view these days. Um, here you got the view, although you got a couple of high rises in front of you, so you're not, not having unobstructed views as the uh, as the um, Victoria Place will have uh, in sort of prime ocean front location, but you still have the slits of ocean view. Uh, but next slide, it's um, and 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 again the previous slide. Maybe Michael go back one more time. Uh, that one is uh, cheating a little bit because we don't see too much of that sun in there. So there's just a little bit in there. But again, if this is sunset. Uh, you will have lots of sun in there. And it's going to get very, very hot in that unit. That next slide uh, will then cause what we had been analyzing, what the symphony does on Kapiolani Boulevard. The show called Top Right is what would give you a sunburn um, if you wouldn't hide behind your, your glass and, um, and have the AC blasting. So again, um, east and west uh, elevations, unfortunately, we can't give a green uh, positive check mark that gets a red one, literally and figuratively speaking, because we're lacking a shading there. And as we say in bioclimatic design rules 101, east and west, you got to do vertical shading. Ideally, louver is turned towards the north. So you're blocking off uh, the overheating you sun, but you let in the ambient daylight which you want, and you still get a view, you know? And it's a direct view, but it is a view, so it's possible. They didn't do it. Uh, next slide. Um, we, again, uh, have to give another plus primarily, principally, because uh, different than the Anaha and the Victoria Place that has no lanai's, we see lanai's here. And that's sort of um, interesting because the two Howard Hughes projects are very exclusive. Uh, they're for sale, they're condos, and they're high end. So the rich people don't get lanai's, sorry for them. And here, the little bit more little people, which at least was the ambition of the project, they're more, they're more uh, privileged because they get uh, something that we would think, uh, you know, um, is um, something that gets close to lanai's. 
This sort of zigzagging way that they gave it reminds us of the very top left, the show quote from Munich's uh, most uh, interesting and, um, and fascinating um, uh, student dormitory. Uh, quoting in the middle at the top uh, from their website and you know playing off heavily of that name branding and the Lilia and how it how it blossoms in this beautiful um, you know uh, violet kind of color. This is what top right uh, this dormitory has in real because there's actually this vine crawling up on it, this creeper vine as uh, De Soto taught us. That one has flowers and these flowers actually help to perform bioclimatically because they create um, in temperate climate um, uh, uh, temporary uh, shading and, and help to keep the building cool while in the winter time, because this is a deciduous plant, it uh, gets uh, rid of the leaves, which you see at the very top left, and then allows passive solar gain. So um, again, we don't see anything like that. We see some sort of guardrail wrappers uh, on the picture at the bottom. And next slide reveals that that was only temporarily for the construction and um, to hide what we now see, which again makes us want to give a plus. Uh, because these are not glass guardrails that we said should be banned from building code in Honolulu because they do nothing but be wrong from their energy um, uh, bill of production, of shipping in, of putting in place, making yourself hot behind. All these things uh, make glass guardrails something that we continuously say we don't want. So the developer here did it differently and he defaulted back to the good old vertical guardrail uh, that basically allows breathability, also doesn't, you know, get, when it gets dirty, it doesn't obstruct the view. So it's basically uh, just the, the better way, the better version to do it. And, but um, if we look closer at the Lanai's, we want to reference back to the, um, to the uh, sibling project, gets us to the next slide, please which is uh, the mid-century um, few story walk-ups across the street that we talked in the last show that the developer was basically um, uh, making up for the mandate of affordable units. And he basically put them into these historic buildings. But in there, you can see what people then do on their lanai's. They're not just spending time there, but they're also leaving things there that makes sense when you're living in a maritime metropolis because there's boogie boards, there's surfboards and stuff like that. And while that basically is, is okay and is a nice sort of an occupational decor, a performative um, you know, ornament, you can say, um, imagine you do this in the high rise where winds are sometimes pretty high. So I'm not sure if especially the light boogie boards would just you know, basically fly away from your uh, from your uh, lanai space that then you know makes you question if to what degree the term lanai um, actually uh, applies and so uh, next slide next slide is a reference to a project of ours on the other side of the world in temperate climate uh, where we were affording lanai's um, as well but you see the lanai's are significantly deeper. They're about like three, four, up to five feet. Uh, we have a glass guardrail because we need them because we only have a few you know, months uh, in the year where it's really warm outside. The other times it's rather not. And so we uh, enjoy being a little bit warmer behind glass guardrails. Also, we recognize uh, the need for maybe storage where you can store your boogie board and your surfboard, which we don't have in Hanover, Germany, because there's no ocean to surf or to boogie board. But we dedicated this box in the box, a wooden box in a glass box that you can store your things, which is also a good sort of privacy mitigator between the units because the glass goes all the way up. So it gives you acoustical separation, acoustical privacy while the, the, the daylight is able to uh, jump, uh, jump over. 
And uh, the little um, you know, um, inserted detail up there is a, a product that's been around in Europe forever. It made it to Canada and not to the US. And I saw the Lilia under construction. I didn't see this. This is a product that's called Iso Shuck. And it's basically um, structurally connecting the lanai to the inner floor slab by at the same time with this rigid foam strip, uh, basically um, thermally disconnecting it because otherwise it's a thermal leakage that again, we don't need because the warm air uh, or the warm, uh, the warm thermal mass uh, gets basically transferred uh, into the building. So these are suggestions again, and this is uh, again, Hanover, Germany. So if you can build that way in Hanover, Germany, you should build differently in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, next slide. And so uh, you see it here, you see uh, some rather, uh, you know, more apologetic division partitions between the units that aren't doing uh, as much as the ones we just showed to you. Um, again, also the uh, lanai's are rather shallow and you can see uh, the sort of midday shadow line here, not doing uh, much. So um, the lanai's might not have the depth than uh, the ones in Germany and not the ones uh, more importantly of the Waikiki Grand. And even in the Waikiki Grand, they could have been, should have been a little deeper but they're significantly deeper than the ones here. So the final slide, uh, zooming in even more, you might have already seen it in the previous slide. We see something rather suspicious, uh, which is a box with a fan. And this is something that looks familiar to us, but we don't want to see anymore these days. This is a single wall AC unit that they try to camouflage away by painting it with the same uh, so predominant on the island, beige color. But again, we're not blind and we're seeing it. So that gives us another indication that again, the Lanai's are not doing the job uh, to the degree they should have and they could have if they would have been engineered with uh, the sun as a co-designer and, and using and applying the sun angles because the orientation is, is good for horizontal shading. So that um, is it for today. Uh, we're picking up from here uh, next week again uh, with uh, three from the assessment board, DeSoto and Ron, hopefully back. And until then, you all stay most importantly healthy and happy and uh, increasingly tropically exotic, please again. Bye-bye.